from Google Cloud Next 19 in beautiful San Francisco, where tens of thousands are gathered to build the cloud for everyone. I'm Stephanie Wong. And I'm Red Meyer. We'll be with you throughout the next two days of Google Cloud Next 19, bringing you keynote recaps, interviews with Google experts, and some very cool product demos. If you miss anything along the way, fear not, you can catch up anytime at g.co slash nextonair. The Next On Air live stream experience is crafted to dive deeper into content that matters to you most. Beyond the next live show, we've got five other channels streaming simultaneously too, with some keys to the cloud universe. Build, run, analyze and learn, secure and collaborate, all available to you on your preferred device at home. In yesterday's keynote, we heard all about modernization with Google Cloud. Today's keynote took us a step further, focusing on infrastructure, insight and innovation. Director of Cloud AI Strategy and Operations, Tracy Fay, is here with us to tell us more. Tracy, give us the highlights from today's keynote. So I think one of the most exciting things is that we're really starting to see how customers are leveraging the cloud and building cloud strategy no matter where they're starting, whether that's starting from on-prem, hybrid, all of these things are now available. And we, uh, as an overall cloud organization, have been working really hard to make it incredibly easy for customers to start where they are and leverage our products and services to really update their infrastructure and drive innovation for their companies. And that was really clear to me today and it was really exciting to see it all come together. Now, AI is embedded in everything we do. What are you most excited for uh, uh, about AI and Google Cloud and other parts of Google? You know, it's a, a little bit of a similar answer, to be honest. So over the last year and a half, I've spoken with hundreds of customers, and everybody is really excited about AI, but a lot of organizations don't know what that means, and they don't know how AI can impact their business and the business problems that they're facing today. And we've been working really hard to create a set of products and solutions and services that can help address some of those mission critical problems very easily for customers. And so I'm really excited to see some of those examples really start to come to light. Things like Salesforce working with Hulu on our contact center, our natural language processes being a part of the Einstein bot, uh, you know, things like what Baker Hughes GE is doing with our cloud AI platform. It's really exciting to see these tactical examples of how AI can impact an enterprise. Yeah, absolutely. We saw a lot of great demos showing Google Cloud products at work. How are these new products helping our customers manage data reliably and securely so they can modernize, scale, and, and really be successful? Well, if you look at what we saw in the smart analytics demo, you could really see the end-to-end -end experience for customers. And that's a lot of where the pain has been. So, for example, in Cloud AI, uh, we own Kaggle, which is the world's largest community of data scientists. And they often joke that uh, data scientists will say that 90% of the pain in machine learning is cleaning the data, and 10% is complaining about cleaning the data. And that is an experience that I think anybody who has worked to extract insights from their data can relate to because it can be extraordinarily painful. And when you see all of the products that are coming together across our smart analytics platform, everything from BigQuery and Data Fusion, all of those pieces, uh, AutoML tables, you can start to see how easy it can be for customers to extract those insights at scale very quickly. And speaking of these features that help our data analytics workflows, we saw some great demos highlighting some new features like Cloud Data Fusion, BigQuery BI Engine, and AutoML tables. How can developers, scientists, and analysts apply these to support their hybrid workloads? So I can speak specifically to AutoML tables because that's the product that uh, our team works on. And one of the things that uh, I have really loved about the AutoML suite is that it really doesn't require machine learning expertise to use it. And at the same time, it's an extraordinarily helpful tool for people who are machine learning experts and builders. And it has the ability to stretch across those populations and make it really useful for anybody. We have heard over and over that structured data is a real challenge for customers. And so being able to leverage something like AutoML tables where customers can start to piece together information from disparate data sets, build them all together, allow machine learning models to be created for you through the AutoML tool without having to write any code, it just is really exciting to see what that can do. Yeah, absolutely. And can you give us some examples from today's keynote of how our viewers will be able to use machine learning and Google AI? It, 
especially those in companies just starting out who may not already have a lot of ML experience. Yeah, absolutely. So there are a couple problems that we've heard from customers that are really common across the landscape of enterprise customers. A top one is in contact centers and customer service. And this is a challenge that almost every organization I've spoken with faces in some form or fashion. Our AI has worked really hard to enhance the human agents who are working in contact centers, give them everything they need at their fingertips in a really efficient and beautiful way. And what we've done there is integrate our AI with the key players in the contact center space so that it doesn't require customers to do a full rip and replace on hardware they've already purchased. And so that's a very easy way to get started. Um, we've also heard from almost every customer that another area that they really struggle with is dark data. And that exists in documents that are both physical documents, digital documents. The challenge, if you, can, you, know, if you think about um, a paper that you read or a PDF where you have graphs and tables and all kinds of information and the, the ability to actually be able to extract those pieces, those components using AI, make sense of them, uh, and then pull insights out of that through our document understanding AI, um, we really believe is going to help customers uh, gain efficiency and information much faster. And that's another way that I think would be great for customers to get started that we've seen today. Now, many people may know that we build AI into a lot of our products, like G Suite, Google Maps. How can our customers use those tools uh, to build their innovative features into their own tools and products? So we offer a range of products, everywhere from pre-trained APIs to AutoMLs, where you can customize uh, to meet your specific needs through to our Cloud AI platform where you can very easily build your own machine learning models if you have that expertise. And so across that range, there's an opportunity for customers to really be able to leverage the power of Google AI in almost every business problem they face. And that can be very exciting and it can be a little bit daunting if you don't know exactly where to get started. And so we are offering a number of solutions through things like our professional services organization for customers who aren't sure where to start Start, we can help them. Um, and then we have a series of demos, of tools, all kinds of information that you can gather to really help you figure out where AI can help make your business better. So as the Director of AI Strategy, is there anything you can tell us about what we can look forward to in the near future? That's a great question. So I think, you know, what's top of mind for me is all of the ways that we can make AI easier for companies to use, um, how we can help them scale their businesses. And so, uh, you know, we are spending a lot of time in, um, in really building that ease of use into everything we offer. Another area that you will likely start to see from us is um, continuing our efforts around explainability. So I really firmly believe that in order for AI to be successful, uh, it really has to be trusted. And in order for it to be trusted, it has to be built and deployed and thought of responsibly. And part of that is about understanding what is in those machine learning models and how they're making decisions. And so we have a lot of exciting efforts around explainability and interpretability. Yeah, awesome, and trust is such an important feature in, in all of the things that we do. That's right. Tracy, thank you so much for helping us understand the power of AI to improve our work. You're so welcome, glad to be here. Now, if you've got a question or a comment on today's keynote or about our talk with Tracy, reach out to us on social media using the hashtag GoogleNext19. And next, there are lots of opportunities to get one-on-one -on -one learning and hands-on time with our products in the Dev Zone. We sent our reporter, Mark Merchandani, over to the Dev Zone to check it out. Mark, tell us what's happening over there. Hey, everyone. We're here at the Google Cloud Next Developer Zone. This is full of cool little showcases, hands-on labs, tutorials, and, of course, the Dev Zone stage, where people are able to come here and learn all about the cool things, but really get their hands on them and play around with them. Speaking of which, we're at the BQML station with Felipe Hoffa, who loves data and BigQuery. So Felipe, tell me a little bit more about what we're looking at here. Hi, Mark. So what we have here is a Stack Overflow predictor. How long will it take for people to answer your question? So what does that mean specifically? So I can go into Stack Overflow, I can ask a question, but someone's not going to respond immediately. Yeah, so I don't know if you ever ask a question on Stack Overflow. It takes some time, and you never know how long will it take. Well, with this tool, we can kind of predict how long will it take, looking at all the past data that we have from Stack Overflow. 
Now, how do you do that? Because BigQuery, you can do a bunch of data analysis, but you can't build a machine learning model in BigQuery, right? Well, you can now. So I love BigQuery. I love that analytics. Uh, thanks to the public data program, we have a copy of Stack Overflow, the dump that they publish every quarter. So we loaded that in BigQuery, and then you can start running your own SQL queries over it. Anyone can come and run any query they want. They have a free terabyte every month. So the, the first step with that analytics is just to look at all your questions, look at all your answers, and get an average of how long did it take for people to answer questions on Stack Overflow. So people can come here to the next showcase floor, play around with this interface here, change and see if they ask a question, and then based on the machine learning model, they'll see about how long they'd have to wait for someone to go in and answer it. Exactly, so how did we go from the analytics of just average group by to a prediction? Um, there's a lot of spaces in between, like, uh, for example, to get an answer for the Google BigQuery tag, at 8 a.m. for a medium question that ends with a, doesn't end with a question mark, that starts with a Y. For someone that created an account in 2017, uh, we're predicting that it will get, take 53 minutes. Um, maybe they will not get an answer, but with an 85% of probability, they will get one. And they, there is a chance of being downvoted of about a 7% for these statistics. Now, how did we build this? Uh, we used, uh, we created a linear regression using all of these features and the data that we had available. So with all this different information, you can know when you ask a question, approximately, hopefully pretty relatively, when it's going to be answered, but you could also maybe even predict when's the best time to ask a question. Exactly. If you want to go the opposite way, so let's say uh, it takes 53 minutes on a Tuesday, on Sunday it takes more like an hour to get an answer but there's a higher chance of getting an answer. So lots of cool information to play around with here, but people can also come here and actually learn BQML hands-on, right? Exactly, so th there are two alternatives. For people that are not here, to see how I made this, um, they can go to my blog post on Medium, just search for Felipe Hoffa, when will Stack Overflow reply? And if you are here at Next, uh, we have code labs ready for you to run uh, that you can also find online. But there are so many ways to learn and get your hands into these tools. Perfect. So lots of cool stuff from BQML. Come down to the floor, get started, or check out the resources online. Hi, I'm Natalie, and we are in the Intelligence neighborhood in the Sounds and Models demo, and I'm joined here by Yufang. Yufang, tell us a little bit about what you do and this awesome demo that you've created. Here we have Station 1 gathering data, and we have this kind of instrument, if you will, but it's actually five instruments. And so each string represents a different instrument and we can pluck our string to make different sounds. And what we're gonna do is use this as our kind of data source. The sounds are going to then go into data flow and get converted into spectrograms. They're gonna get moved into this, the frequency space. And those images can then be used to train our model. The hope is that these images will be distinct enough to be able to um, represent you know, each. Exactly, that we can and tell them instrument. apart, that we can distinguish between instrument one, two, three, four, and five. Cool, okay, so we've got our training data. Now yeah. it's time to start training the model. So with AutoML, we can train models using the data that we had, but then we don't have to do any extra work. So we can see here that the data is coming in, and you can see those are the, some of the spectrograms. Those are the real data that attendees have generated over the course of today. So they're the images of the sound waves. That's right. These are the spectrograms. And then when you train a model, it just does the training. There's not much kind of work you have to do. And when it finishes training, you can have some evaluation data that shows you uh, the metrics around how well the model trained and how it did. Right, so if you're new to ML, that's a great space to get started. Auto that's right. ML. It's an easy tool to get going with. And if you have some data you want to you know, throw it, Auto ML Vision, it'll take care of it for you. And you can go do something else with your time. So we have this board here where you can move these kind of sliders around to different positions. And they map to different values on the screen, which change the values of hyperparameters of the actual models. Things like kernel width and height, the layer size, the number of strides, as well as the kind of number of layers you have. And that actually will actually change the amount of code on the screen. Once we're happy with you know, a set of settings that we have, we can go ahead and push the button here and start a training job. And 
Doing that, will it'll assign us a name, something fun like Spinto Cap, and shoot that off to Kubeflow, where we have a pipeline to do training. And when it finishes training, it'll deploy it on the Cloud AI platform prediction service. Awesome. So time to move to stage three of That's training right. our model. Speaking of predictions. <laughs> All right, we're at the final stage now, right. and that's to predict the notes. Yes, and so we're going to try to pull up the model that we've been training, Spinto Cap. It's there for us. So you can turn the crank as a selector, and then press the red button to select it. Select. And so this is kind of like a customizable music box, and we can choose which notes to play on which instrument. More like, xylophone. You, know, you can hit the button again. So in, a, in this countdown, then we'll be able to turn this crank now. And so these are these are the notes that we set up. We're going to send those notes off to the Cloud AI Platform Prediction Back. Service. Now, how did we do, right? Was our model any good? Because we chose those parameters kind of randomly. And so it might be good. It might not be so good. We'll, we'll see, right? It got some of them. It seemed like it might have actually missed a bunch. It did. And so, you know, this is part of the machine learning workflow. Uh, this particular case, a pretty abysmal outcome. Yeah, but that's all right, because that's all it part is. of machine learning, right? right. It's, it's right. all part of the process. So I think this is a perfect demonstration to show that. So, Yufeng, thank you so much for this demonstration. I think it was very clear in kind of the three stages of what to expect when um, training machine learning models. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks so much, Natalie. And back to you. This year, we're bringing some of the Showcase experiments home to you. Cloud Showcase Online lets you explore and get hands-on creative code experiences with Google Cloud, including the BQML experiment from earlier. Check out g.co slash showcase slash experiments and start riffing on our code. The next round of sessions is coming up shortly. Join us back here after that when we'll be talking Kubernetes and checking out more DevZone experiments and showcase demos from Next19. Welcome back to the next live show. I'm Stephanie Wong. Joining us now is Jennifer Lin, Product Management Director. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. So for those viewers who are just learning about Kubernetes and Borg, can you explain what each of those is and how we're making Kubernetes easier to consume and the significance of how each has evolved at Google? Sure. Uh, Kubernetes is the externalization and the open source of our internal controller development container orchestration tool called Borg. It's something that we've uh, evolved over the last decade and we have said publicly that we launch 4 billion containers a week across the Google environment. So managing that at scale, we've learned a lot about just running large global global scale systems and doing container orchestration at scale in a resilient, reliable way. Uh, Kubernetes was open sourced a few years ago and we've had our own managed version of uh, Kubernetes with Google Kubernetes Engine now over four years. So a lot has happened in a very short period of time, but there's lots of lessons learned under the covers. We continue to talk about API services and open source. Why is Google differentiating in this space? Yeah, I think you know this industry is changing so fast. Developers writing new software, so it's really important that we get the interfaces and how to enable the lifecycle management of services right as a uh, you know system. And I think that's why Kubernetes has also uh, gained a lot of traction very quickly. It sort of makes the notion of a service a first-class citizen. And we've been very clear about how do APIs interact and how do we essentially define services and do the lifecycle management of services, and that's all coming with the maturity of things like Kubernetes and Istio. Yeah, and this is all enabling our developers. A lot of developers want to approach the way that Google does and dive in and get experience the way that Google develops software. How does open source enable the community and empower the community? Yeah, I think open source has been the reason why a lot of this has moved so quickly. I mean, it feels like overnight it has become, Kubernetes has become sort of the container orchestration system of, of choice. Just a few years ago, there were so many, there was a lot of fragmentation, a lot of folks understood the value proposition of containerization with Docker, but essentially managing that at scale at the system level, there were various options. Through open source, I think we've uh, allowed a lot of people to just, number one, understand what's going on, number two, contribute in a way that's meaningful 
helpful for them uh, and get a lot of the use cases out there in the open so we can iterate on best practices, et cetera. And you know, yes, a lot of this has been very focused on developer agility, but now as we move into sort of the maturity of it, yes, a lot of the practices for the operational administrators and SREs and uh, making this essentially a production level system is a lot of what the community is excited about as well. That's great, yeah, open source is really focused on our users and we also want to build our user experience into our products. Can you talk a little bit more about that and given that our cloud users are different and they have different needs, how do we build that into our products as well? Yeah, I mean on the product side within Google we do a lot with the user research team to just make sure we understand who are the personas, whether it's developer or a security administrator or a network administrator or the IT professional or the user. Uh, so just making sure we're taking sort of a use case driven approach and understanding sort of who is the user of the product and essentially, you know, what problem are they trying to solve and how do we hide the complexity and make it a lot easier and make sure that they're essentially doing their job well. Um, but there are a lot, because this is a software stack with a lot of, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about decoupling and separation of concerns. Um, you can have a unified stack, but you have to recognize that there's lots of folks that essentially are consumers of that stack. So what's your advice for those who want to move to the cloud with acceleration and not have to do a rip and replace and manage their existing life cycle? How do they bring in cloud native? Yeah, I think uh, cloud native has really been about sort of openness and uh, you know the flexibility that we talked about today with, with Anthos is really there are uh, an architectural set of principles, which I think Kubernetes and, and things like Istio have uh, kind of put out there in the open source community. There's a framework and then there's an implementation. So number one, I think the industry is really rallying around the fact that uh, container orchestration, there's sort of a clear uh, you know, de facto standard there. Uh, obviously we have our managed version of that because there's a lot beyond just the software bits in terms of how do you actually, you know, do lifecycle management and keep essentially, you know, automatic upgrades, patching, uh, security updates, et cetera, as part of the system and so that developers can move quickly but you can keep essentially the security and stability of the system. Right, and one, one big part of the acceleration is GKE on-prem, which was announced last August. And this is the first time we've actually brought our technology into the data center at this scale. So why now and, and why not sooner? Yeah, I mean, what we found is everybody understands the benefits of cloud, but in many cases there's technical and non-technical reasons why they can't move all their workloads into cloud overnight. So this was a lot about bringing the best of the Kubernetes uh, you know, stack and what we're doing with Google Cloud to the on-prem environment and helping people move at their own pace while at the same time modernizing in place. So it's not just about renting compute cycles, it's actually about application modernization and developing new services and adding more business value, et cetera. So we're pretty excited about that. It, now it's not just on our GCP resources, but we can essentially run this on uh, you know, third-party servers in a private data center for the enterprise, and as we talked about today, other environments as well. So speaking of modernization, we loved your demo during the day one keynote. Thank you. We heard a lot about modernizing in place this year. Can you talk about how Anthos enables you to modernize your applications no matter where they are, as you mentioned, on-premises or in the cloud? Yeah, I think that's the nice thing about you know Kubernetes is uh, you know with Anthos we're really thinking about sort of open APIs so that the interfaces between those environments number one we can hide the complexity but still keep a consistent management environment for the developers independent of where those workloads run they can learn uh, you know one set of tools and essentially evolve as the industry evolves without picking sort of exactly where that's going to run or or you know uh, what production environment it's going to run in because many developers don't know they want to write once run anywhere where their consumers may be running in many, many clouds. And similarly for the platform administrator, uh, they don't have to learn uh, a bunch of different vendor tools. This framework is here to stay. Uh, we believe it's gonna you know, be the, the standard for, for many years to come. So even if that's not running in Google's cloud per se, that skill set that many enterprises are trying to hire people who understand Kubernetes, that's very portable. So people are willing to invest in it now uh, because it's, it's gonna be uh, here to stay for, for many years. And on that theme, we're, we're hearing that developers and operators want to be managing at higher levels of the stack, but they still want visibility and control over policy management at a service level. How is Anthos providing a unified programming model and monitoring and policy across on-premise and multiple clouds? Yeah, great question. I mean, I, with Kubernetes, obviously, we've uh, really thought about container orchestration and cluster administration at scale. Uh, you know, with Istio, we're thinking about 
assuming most of your microservices are now containerized, how do you look out for the life cycle and health of those services and the interactions between those services? How do you make sure that those services are authenticated and, and that you can put essentially policies around those uh, services without having to manage the underlying infrastructure complexity? Uh, and then we showed how we're doing config management and automating essentially configurations at scale in a way that essentially is declarative. So you can define the policies once and push them down to different environments and you don't have to rewrite them with a lot of toil for each cloud environment. And that's really important for customers that are thinking about, let's say, you know, PCI compliance or governance. Uh, th those rules around how to have those security controls in place don't change cloud to cloud, but today they're spending a lot of time just to make sure they can you know, uh, ensure audit and compliance in each different environment. So we believe that sort of extra overhead that doesn't need to be there, and that was a, a key push with, with Anthos. Many of our enterprise customers, uh, they want to uh, embrace new technologies, but it's not easy to figure out how do I ensure that I'm still reducing my cost, keeping the efficiency, and uh, you know, addressing what the auditors and, and compliance regulatory environments are looking for. Right, and we actually know that not everybody has the luxury of moving to the cloud immediately for whatever reason. How can we help them get there? Yeah, I think a lot of it is, I mean, this has been a, a great week so far. I think uh, the partner community is very engaged. I think a lot of the use cases and the best practices that are being put out there are based on, you know, folks, uh, trying things out, uh, you know, sharing best practices. Uh, we're, we're trying to take more of a use case driven approach. With Enthos, I think a lot of what we're trying to share is the operational domain knowledge and the best practices of us, you know, having run these systems at scale, but also tapping into, you know, our hundreds of ecosystem partners who are getting excited about it and contributing back. Um, you know, as this matures, and I think this is uh, happening very quickly in the last uh, couple of years, uh, but it really is about solution delivery and not just technology delivery. With Anthos, all these customers moving into production at scale is very exciting. And, uh, you know, obviously, as you said, there are security concerns. How are we making that easier for our customers? Yeah, I mean, we've been, uh, you know, security is a major differentiator for us for GCP more broadly. And I think because containerization is uh, relatively a new space, we've been doing a lot with both our customers and partners to do, number one, you know, education and awareness around container security and secure software supply chains and things like binary authorization and CICD and how to make sure that security is baked in way upstream so that when a developer checks in code, essentially it starts the, the you know, governance process of security and it's not a bolt-on afterthought um, after the fact. I think that is a lot of the way that the Google, Google developers are. When they check in code, essentially they don't have to be an expert in security, but the platform takes care of a lot of the complexity of, of security and governance. Thank you so much for your time, Jennifer. Thanks for having me. Got a question or a comment on Anthos or Kubernetes? Reach out to us on social media with the hashtag GoogleNext19. We're going to stick with the Anthos topic for a bit and head down to the showcase floor where our team is demoing a new solution that allows customers to modernize to containers. We're here at the Infrastructure and Migration Zone of Google Cloud Next. I'm Mark Merchandani. I'm here with Shanath. Shanath, we heard a lot today about Anthos. What is Anthos? Why is it so exciting? Anthos is incredibly exciting for us at Google Cloud. We announced Anthos as Cloud Services Platform just over eight months ago. And today we're very excited to announce general availability of Anthos for our customers to be able to use it. Anthos is our hybrid and multi-cloud platform that gives our customers the ability to build once and run anywhere. Why is hybrid and multi-cloud so important right now? That's a great question, Mark. So hybrid and multi-cloud has been on top of mind for a lot of our customers. They're very, very excited about the ability to use clouds, but oftentimes what happens is when they're running something on-prem but running something else in the cloud, it becomes hard for them to manage these different deployments that make them segment their workforce into engineers who are working on different things instead of focusing on innovating for their customers. So that's why hybrid and multi-cloud is very important, and it's very important to have a uniform platform like Anthos that lets customers run in a uniform way across the board. So we're talking about standardizing, making sure that everyone's on the same level. Uh, for people who are here at the showcase, mm -hmm. they can come interact with this booth. What does this tell people who are looking at what does Anthos do for me? So what we have in this demo is we've taken the analogy of a city and how it works, and we've used that to show how hybrid and multi-cloud is very important and how Anthos helps in that particular analogy. So let's get started. So we have these three things that you can do over the course of this demo. First, let's start off by modernizing your services. 
there are multiple reasons you would want to modernize your service. For instance, it gives you a lot more agility and speed and lets you deploy faster. So in this demo, there are two options for how you can modernize your applications. You can either containerize them manually or you can use CSP Migrate, which is now called Anthos Migrate, to be able to migrate these applications automatically from VMs running on-prem into containers running in the cloud. So for the sake of this run through, let's select modernizing with Velostrata, which is Anthos Migrate. So Velostrata automatically containerizes your VM-based workloads and will deploy them to GKE running in the cloud. So just as easily as that, you'll have all of your VMs now move to the cloud as containers. And now let's look at the second part. We also help you standardize config management using Anthos Config Management. What Anthos Config Management lets you do is it lets you take a single configuration and deploy it across the board declaratively and uniformly without you having to go and do it once at a time per platform. So no matter whether you're running only on-prem, in Google Cloud, or maybe even with other clouds, you can do this all at once. Right, so now it's all standardized. So now it's all standardized. And so for the third part of this demo, there's something very uh, exciting for me, which is a service mesh. A service mesh is basically a mechanism that lets you look deep into the traffic that's actually flowing between your applications, whether they run on-premise or in the cloud. In this case, what we're going to do is we're going to use Anthos to implement a service mesh between on-prem will here and the two cloud wills that we have. And by doing this, we're able to select a service and we're able to say that let's upgrade the service. Now, when you upgrade the service, you pick a new version that you want to upgrade to, but instead of upgrading everything at once, what you're going to do is you're going to select a small percentage of your VMs or workloads and upgrade them at once. So when you do this and you upgrade these containers at that point in time, you will upgrade just that 20% so that you see everything's running fine and you don't have anything broken. And once you're confident that this service is working well, you can upgrade everything else. So this means now you're able to roll out applications with limited downtime to almost zero downtime for your customers. So you can see how Anthos uses open source technologies, but also this idea of standardization to really bring it to everybody. Yes. What's an example customer or concrete use case that Anthos has right now? Great question. So we have a lot of customers who've been very excited to use Anthos, and they span multiple verticals. Like for instance, HSBC from retail and banking, and Siemens, who's a giant when it comes to manufacturing, are also looking at Anthos as their platform of choice for doing IoT and their IoT platform. So there are multiple customers across verticals like retail and healthcare who are very excited about this platform and love that ability to standardize and have a uniform platform. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Srinath. I'm sure there's going to be tons of great content here about Anthos and lots of other stuff at Google Cloud Next, so stay tuned. Thanks, team. Check out this next dev byte where we explore how human bias can sometimes creep into our work without us realizing it. This is Michelle Casbon. She's an engineer at Google on the Kubeflow team. And this is John Bohannon. He's the director of science at Primer, an AI startup. My team at Primer built a machine learning system that reads millions of news articles and tells you what it learns. And I worked with them to deploy this system with Kubeflow to make it portable and scalable. The goal is to create a machine to help humans learn about the world and overcome their biases. Humans are biased. Consider this riddle. A boy and his father are in a car crash. The father is killed instantly. The boy is rushed to the hospital and prepped for surgery with one of the best doctors in the country. The doctor arrives, sees the boy on the table, and says, I can't operate on this patient. He's my son. Who's the doctor? It's a paradox, right? Father's dead, so... It's the boy's mother. For those playing at home, don't feel bad. 85% of people are stumped by this question. It even worked on Michelle when she first heard it. Bias is powerful. All humans have it and we all have to work against it constantly. Every time you meet someone, you can't help but make assumptions. But you're probably biased. Wait, that one's actually mine. And that one's mine. Oh. You're totally biased. Well, any system built on human decisions will inherit human bias. Consider Wikipedia. It has grown into the world's most important general purpose information resource, but there's no one in charge. Information is added to Wikipedia day after day by millions of volunteers. It just boggles the mind that such a thing can exist and that it actually works. Wikipedia aims to be the summary of all human knowledge. 
but it has biases, just like the humans who create it. If you think about all the new things we learn about the world each day, keeping Wikipedia up to date seems impossible. It's not just that important information is missing from most articles, but it's that many important articles haven't been written at all. Which shouldn't be that surprising, right? Well, so there are about 5 million Wikipedia articles. In English alone, yep. And there are some thousands of news articles published every day. Hundreds of thousands, just in English. So you just have to read all of it. You find the important information that's in one set and doesn't exist in the other. Okay, yeah, that's hard. Machine learning to the rescue. I decided to start by focusing on people. We want a system that just reads all the news every day and learns new information about everyone. Not only people described in Wikipedia, but anyone described in the news. And if there's enough significant information about someone in the news who's missing from Wikipedia, the system should just write you the first draft of the article. The goal is to make it as easy as possible for the human editors of Wikipedia to do their job. And the first step is to shine a really bright light so we can see where our bias is. For example? Well, for example, only about 15% of Wikipedia's biographical articles are about women, and that gender gap is especially bad for scientists. If you never hear about all the amazing women of science and engineering, then it reinforces your bias about those professions. Exactly. And that's why I wanted to work with Primer on this in the first place. Right. And here we are just a few weeks later, and we're actually catching up on where we are with deployment. So, where we left off, uh, we had this really cool ML system with some really classic ML deployment problems. Kubeflow to the rescue! Our first problem was scaling. So the computing load is all over the map on this one. On any given day, we're like processing hundreds of thousands of documents, news articles, scientific papers, and we're updating information about people in our knowledge base. But we also have users who might want to add thousands of new people all at once. And that kicks off a backfill of information about those people from millions of historical documents. But this turned out to be easy to solve because your team had already set up a Kubernetes cluster. Now, Kubeflow is built on Kubernetes because scalability is baked into the platform. Now, the application backend was built on top of Postgres, which was a straightforward migration into Cloud SQL. But once the data was migrated, I transplanted the full app into Kubernetes Engine. I started with a single node cluster and enabled auto-provisioning, which scales the size of the cluster up and down based on resource requests. So now we can deal with unpredictable and bursty computing loads like yours. OK, but on top of the scaling problem, I've also got a complexity problem. So our data pipeline has a bunch of spaghetti junctions. And not only do we have thousands of models to load at inference time, but we have to update those models as new information comes in. So at training, it adds up to like millions of model features getting updated every day. I noticed that. Well, luckily, this is exactly what Qflow is designed for, composability. The platform provides patterns for reusing common ML tasks, like updating models incrementally in the background. I started by carving out pieces of the app. For example, model training was refactored into a separate service that uses Qflow operators. The monolith is now separated into smaller, distinct pieces. Now it's a pipeline with three separate steps, train, serve, and web app. Oh, that sounds much nicer. OK, so how is it looking so far? Well, the refactoring immediately reduced the training runtime, so that translates directly to cost savings. And now you don't have to run huge nodes all the time, because GKE takes care of the scaling for you. Well, the other win is the decrease in code complexity. That translates to less maintenance overhead, less time searching for the source of bugs, less time on ramping new engineers, and adding new features. OK, but that creates a new problem. What haven't I thought of? So you know, now we have all this saved time. What am I going to do with all my time? You could create some Wikipedia articles about women of science. Hmm, good call. Oh, and what about the last thing on my wish list about vendor lock-in? We don't want our system tied to one cloud infrastructure. We want it to be able to deploy anywhere, even on-prem. Oh, and bonus points if the solution is free and open source. Check and check. As long as you're running standard open source Kubernetes, you can run Kubeflow. Wait, Kubeflow is open source? Yep. What? Thanks for listening. I hope that hearing about this project lowers the bar for trying it yourself. The Kubeflow community has some great resources for getting started, which you can find at kubeflow.org. And hey, got a few minutes of free time? I've already used this machine learning system to identify thousands of notable women of science who are missing from Wikipedia. 
You can make a difference right now. Just follow this link and see what the machine has discovered for you. Go fill in a gap in the world's knowledge. Eliminating human bias with Kubeflow can be useful in every industry. You can watch all the live stream content again or share it with your friends and colleagues at g.co slash nextonair. Now, start working up an appetite because right after the next sessions, we're experimenting with pizza and pie. Stay tuned, you're watching the next live show from San Francisco. Welcome everyone, we are here at the Dev Zone at the Pizza Authenticator app. Uh, Terry, tell me, what am I looking at here? I was promised pie, all I see is pizza. What's, what's going on? It, it is a form of pie, right? So we have an app here that will authenticate pizza to a certain region in the country, right? Like we have New York pizza, we have California pizza, we have, uh, Chicago pizza. This app will judge how authentic it is for what style it's supposed to be. Okay, interesting. So uh, why don't you, uh, actually, why don't you show us how it works? Sure. So uh, we have our pizza here, and we have our tablet here. Fantastic. Make sure it's in focus, and bam. And now Pizza Authenticator is judging whether or not this pizza is authentic. Right, so it's chewing on it, and we see that okay. it is pretty confident that this is New York-style pizza. All right, so definitely pizza, probably from New York. Okay. Yeah. Okay, let's, uh, let's check out this over here. It's right. a good-looking pie. This is more... Midwest. So let's see. Make sure it's in focus. We'll do it again. She's taking a bite out of that. Chicago style pizza. Chicago style. All so right, it's good. Nice. All right. Now we'll finish up. Yeah, let's do the we'll last, do last one. Because I'm curious to what uh, style <laughs> pizza this thinks I it think is. It knows. I think it knows what it is. I can't think of any pie that deserves to have zucchini on it. But. Yep. Well, here in the wonderful Golden State. We make abominations. Yes, <laughs> California. Yes, yeah, so it knew it was California pizza. Excellent. Well, yeah. I mean, I'm a huge supporter of anything that involves this amount of pizza. Yeah. But uh, tell me, what what's the point of this? Like, why is this in the dev zone? Why so, have we got this? Yeah. So this uses under the covers ML, right? Okay. Machine learning, and ML is really daunting, right? Like a lot of people come to it and, like they think they need to be a like a data scientist to do it, uh, and your rank and file developer sometimes you know can't approach it. Well, we took we kind of an incredibly trivial use of ML and trained it to like determine whether or not pizza was authentic. Okay. And all of all of this we did, like we grabbed the data, we classified all the images, it was all done by me who is an app dev, not a data scientist. Right, right. So it really shows that anyone can do ML. If I can do it, like anyone can do it. <laughs> so you could take the, the same sort of technology, the same approach here and really apply it to much more meaningful projects. Right, if you wanted to, you know, take pictures, satellite pictures of forests and see how they change over time and see if you can identify trees from the, the forest for the trees, right? Like you could do that with this. And that's a much more serious, you know, application of this, but it's the same principle pizza on, on the forests. Absolutely. No, and it's a, it's a fun way to, to approach uh, machine learning, that sort of stuff. Fantastic. All right, now I believe the real pie is over with Mark. So we're gonna we're gonna dig into some of this. So you pick your favorite style of pizza. I'm gonna go for the authenticated New oh, York style. Oh, I'm going for New York style. I'm yeah, sorry. it's 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 it. hard not to. So uh, we'll dig into this, and uh, we're gonna cross over to you for dessert, Mark. Whether it's pizza, pie, or anything else round, you can't calculate the circumference without knowing about 3.14, also known as pi. But there's a few more digits than that. So let's talk to Emma and see how she broke the world record for calculating 31.4 trillion digits using Google Cloud Platform. So Emma, how did you do it? So we ran a program called Y Cruncher for four months on Google Cloud Platform. And we set up a cluster of 25 machines and uh, we made sure that these machines run continuously without any shutdowns or reboots for 121 days. Yeah, I mean, that's no easy feat. 120 days, all those machines running nonstop. That's kind of something magical, right? Yeah, but Google Cloud has a lot of features and mechanisms to make sure these machines and software are running. And we sell monitoring systems and other uh, techniques that, um, that we use for 
uh, production servers. Because yeah. normally speaking, it's very difficult to keep one process running over 121 days, nonetheless, on 24 machines. Right. So what inspired you to kind of look for this many digits of pi? Like humanity uh, collectively tried to calculate as many digits of pi as possible since like 2000 BC. And even the first electronic computer, ENIAC, was used to calculate 2,000 digits of pi. And ever since then, pi was used as a benchmark to measure the performance and reliability of computers. And now we use Google Cloud, so that means cloud is capable of doing this kind of heavy duty work. That's awesome to see, and congratulations on breaking the world record. Of course, there's more than just numbers in pi. We can also use it to make art. Let's talk to Matthias about how he managed to do really, really cool generative art using all of Emma's work. Matthias, Hi. tell me a little bit more about what you've done here. Right, so 31 trillion digits is a huge number, right? Absolutely. Right? But not only is it a lot of numbers, what's really interesting about uh, Pi is also that the sequence never repeats itself. So we thought, like, what could we do with this? So what we came up with is we made this algorithm that would turn these sequences of Pi into a visual representation, essentially. And this allows people to find 31 trillion different uh, visual representations of, of Pi somewhere within Pi. Can we take a look? Absolutely. So we can jump to any digit within pi that we want. I'll just type in a random number. So from that point on, it takes the next several thousand digits of pi, them being unique within there, and then generate a piece of art out of this, essentially. So if anyone else is here, they can come by, they can change up the numbers, and they'll see different artwork because it's unique sets of pi patterns. Exactly. So someone could come by, say, like, uh, they type in their phone numbers, or like maybe their birthday, the birthday of their, you know, their spouse or whatnot, and um, type this in and then essentially get a unique representation of that number within Pi. Very, very cool. This is just one of the many cool experiments that we have here at the Dev Zone. So hopefully the people here can come check it out and see all the cool work that we've done. Thanks very much, Mark. If you are hungry to try these experiments, head to g.co slash showcase slash experiments. Now we don't have to tell you how important mobile is to how we work, connect, and play. In this next dev bite, we're going under the hood to show you how an ML kit can be used for building mobile apps. It seems machine learning is everywhere nowadays. And with so many offerings for you as a mobile developer, it can get really confusing as to where you should start. I'm Ibrahim Ulukaya, an engineer on the Firebase team, and I'm here today to introduce you to the options that are available to you. If we could carry data centers in our pocket with unlimited battery, it would be much easier. But using ML for mobile apps means thinking about the processing power, battery consumption, and connectivity of our device. There are a number of factors that will dictate the ML strategy and tools you'll want to use. Like whether you want to keep the data local, if you require low latency, or if you need access to the processing power of the cloud. Luckily, Google offers a number of ML options for mobile developers that can help you develop and deploy ML models for the environment that fits your use case. To help you pick which ML deployment option fits best, I'll walk you through a few key decision points. The first question you should ask yourself is, where you want to perform ML inferences, in the cloud or on the device. You would use the cloud if you are already using an existing cloud service for model inferences. Or you run inferences infrequently and want to minimize impact on the device battery life. Or need to support older, less performant devices. Or if you need high accuracy models that require the compute power of the cloud. On the other hand, there are cases in which it might be useful to do ML inference on the mobile device. For example, if you want to keep data local to the device, you need low latency, such as when processing multiple frames in quick succession. You want inferences to work even when the device is offline. Or your users may be in an area of the world where high-speed wireless connectivity is non-existent or unreliable. So now that you understand all the considerations, let me present the options available to you. First is to run inference in the cloud, and there's a world of tools 
any APIs you can use. These include Cloud Vision for image recognition and classification, Cloud Natural Language API for text parsing and analysis, AutoML that allows you to customize models that are served from the cloud. All are available via REST APIs. I won't go into them all here, but you can learn more at cloud.google.com slash products slash AI slash building that blocks. Next is to run inference on the device. And you have two main options. You can either use TFLite directly or you can use MLKit for Firebase. MLKit is a mobile SDK that brings Google's machine learning experience to Android and iOS apps in a powerful yet easy to use package. It comes with a set of ready to use APIs, both for on device and cloud based inference. They support common mobile use cases like image labeling, face detection, text recognition, and barcode scanning to name a few. You simply pass in the data to the MLKit library and it will give you the information you need. Whether you are new to or experienced with machine learning, you can implement the functionality you need all in a few lines of code. And it includes both Android and iOS libraries. While the on-device APIs process data quickly and will work even when there is no network connection, the cloud-based APIs leverage the power of Google Cloud Platform's machine learning technology to give a higher level of accuracy. If you have a use case that's different than offered models, MLKit also offers the ability to deploy and experiment with your own custom TensorFlow Lite models to run on device inference. It works like this. After converting your model to the TF Lite format, you can host and serve it to your users. MLKit for Firebase can then be used to host and dynamically serve TF Lite models to your users and it provides convenient APIs that help you use your custom TF Lite models in your mobile apps. With MLKit for Firebase, you can reduce the initial install size of your mobile app and only download the model when needed. Dynamically swap models on the fly without having to republish your app to the App Store. Target different user segments with models tailored specifically for them. Run A-B experiments with multiple models to find the best performing one. If you'd like, you can also use your TF Lite model on mobile directly with TF Lite APIs. These offer blazingly fast inference times, particularly on Android devices that support the neural network APIs, and a variety of ways to host and deploy your model. For mobile developers looking to implement machine learning into their apps, there are several directions to choose, depending on how much flexibility you want or how specific you, your use case is. We covered some key factors that help you decide, like whether you do your inference on the device or in the cloud, and whether you want to use the pre-trained models Google provides, or train and bring your custom model. Check out our full session at Next for a deep dive analysis, live experiments, and the latest ML offerings from Google. If you want to see more on ML options for mobile developers, check out the full session on g.co slash next on air. Google Cloud is becoming an integral part of how retail business can quickly scale and connect with customers. Let's head back to the showcase floor where Joanna is checking out how IKEA uses Google Cloud to improve customer service. Welcome back to the showroom floor, y'all. I'm really excited to be here because now I'm over in the customer magic zone, and it's really, really cool. But right now, I'm standing with Klaus, who is a senior engineer for IKEA, and he's going to show us one of the most popular demos in the area. There are crowds of people trying to fight their way in right now. Hey, back up. I'm looking at you. Um, but so before you actually show me how it works, can you tell me a little bit about how your team developed this? 
Yeah, sure. So we assemble a pretty small team that uh -huh. we can work in an iterative fashion. Nice. Uh, dividing the work, but close feedback loops together with Google Engineering. Oh, cool. Yeah, and we use the Vision API, product search. The Cloud Vision API? Yes. I love that. Yeah, it's awesome. Together with object detection that okay. we're trying out together with Google. Nice. Yeah, to enhance the, the product offering from, from your side and also, you know, try to work with the customer experience yeah. on our side. So you'll see in the demo. Okay. And then um, you talked about how your team really focused on working iteratively. Now I heard a rumor that y'all did this whole thing in less than three weeks. Is yeah, that that's true? pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah. We're oh fast gosh. paced, uh, very short uh, sprints yeah. that we did, right? So you got to work with, um, you mentioned some Google engineers, which is really cool, but you also you get to work for a company that like really encourages and gives you the space to try these ideas so quickly. Like that. How does that feel, like as oh, a developer? That's really good. That we are, we are empowered to yeah. do this kind of exploration cases. It sounds like a dream, right? Yeah, it is really, it's really. Is. Okay, so speaking of dreams, um, yeah. will you show me how this works? Maybe on the horse right there? Yeah, sure, sure. So this is here. We try to detect the object. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, and then it and then matches, matches to it. our range, right? And then you can interact with it, and it will show you our mobile web page where nice. you can get more information. And then could you do like this stool? Yeah, sure. So let's try it out. It will recognize it and show directly. It's a yawning stool, and then we can move oh. over here. And you oh, can interact. Nice. And so the idea is it. that instead of taking that little pencil, you can walk around and yeah, like exactly. build your list yes. with your phone. Yeah, point and click. Does it even get like decorative items? Of course, of course. So let's try this one out. So you see here, well, it got it directly. This is so cheap, and it's a plant I can't kill. Yeah. Because it's fake. It's even called fake. Yeah. Wait, really? Yeah. Is that like Swedish? A for fake? Yeah. Oh my gosh! I want one so badly. Um, this is a really cool demo. Uh, I, I understand now why there's a crowd of people waiting to get back in here. Yeah, well. So I want to thank you so much for talking to me uh, and you. for building this. Thanks for like, having us here. I'm so excited. I will be in the store pretty soon. You're welcome. <laughs> Have a great day. Yeah, likewise. And then thanks to all of y'all for watching and we'll show you some more cool things later. After the next round of sessions, Rado will be checking out the Fifth Nine Lounge with Dave Renson, Director of CRE and Network Capacity. They'll be chatting about how CRE helps improve reliability. You won't want to miss it. You're watching the next live show in San Francisco. Welcome back to the next live show. Coming up later today, a next favorite, the developer keynote titled, Get to the Fun Part. I'm definitely setting my alarm for this one. But first, let's head to the Fifth Nine Lounge where Rado and Dave Renson, director of CRE and Network Capacity, are hanging out. So Dave, we meet again. It was just, what, nine months ago that you and I were hanging out here at the Fifth Nine Lounge at Next. We were talking about your new book, I think. So uh, what have you been up to since we last spoke? You know, it's cloud. It's only one of Google's fastest growing businesses, so not much. Really, you know, video games, rock climbing, a lot of quinoa, mostly. That sounds about right. Pretty sedate. Anything, anything work-related? <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, lots of stuff. Mostly working with customers and doing everything we can to teach the world what it means to be an SRE and how to do it well. So uh, when attendees come to Next, what can they expect when they visit us here in the Fifth Nine Lounge? Well, really what we're hoping for is to have those deep conversations uh, about how it is they go on their SRE journey. We're still kind of at this stage where we have to really prove to people that, no, this is not just something that only works at Google. You know, it can work anywhere. Okay, let's get down to business and get to the nitty gritty of SRE. How do we help customers move towards implementing SRE practices? Well, so there are two things you really have to do. One, you have to make it easy for them to learn, right? So we wrote these two best-selling books, and so we have a Coursera course, and so we do a lot of writing and public speaking. And then you have to make it easy for them to practice it in the tools, right? So there's a wonderful announcement today from the Stackdriver team about SLO alerting and uh, error budget uh, monitoring. So those are really the two, things, two ways you have to attack that problem. Fantastic. So what is Google doing to help our customers meet their own SLOs? 
You know, I think the best thing a customer can do to reliably meet SLOs, besides building uh, uh, good products, is to actually share their monitoring with Google. Like if you're using Stackdriver, and you set up an SLO dashboard, you can actually share that with us so that when you have difficult moments, and you will, it becomes faster for everyone to debug. Nice. And so what is Google, uh, what is Google doing with our products? to help customers implement those SLOs and error budgets themselves. My, my personal goal at, goal at Google is to make sure that it's easy in every product to practice SRE principles. That rollouts and rollbacks are item potent and easy when you're doing them on, I don't know, GCA, GCE or GKE. You saw the announcement this morning of our new Kubernetes hybrid and on-prem solution. Uh, we're going to make some other announcements about SLO monitoring and burn monitoring in those solutions too. So we're really building at every layer of the stack. Fantastic. Now, I've been hanging out with a few SREs. We hear a lot about accepting failure as normal. How do you recommend customers go about moving from every error is a problem to the mindset of failure is normal? You know, a big problem is that for so long we've all been living under the tyranny of perfection. We expect perfection. And I always say to customers, tell me one system designed by humans, software, hardware, economic, political, anything you want, that's ever been 100% reliable. And they can't. And you know why they can't? because nature's never built one either. So once you accept that it's not possible to do, then the question becomes, well, how much failure is acceptable because you're going to have some? And that's where then we get into the conversations about error budgets and SLOs. Yeah, that's, that's a good segue. Uh, so how do you see customers becoming effective at managing the workloads of their SRE teams? Okay, so, you know, there are some good rule of thumb limits about the number of incidents you can really have during an on-call period, or how much of your project time you can have. So I think a good rule of thumb for people is if you see your teams are spending at all anything uh, less than 50% of their calendar time, their clock time, on engineering projects, they're headed for toil um, and they're not managing their load well. But we can, if you come talk to us, we can help you manage your way through that. Absolutely, and so speaking of that, you know, what are your recommendations to customers on how to take that first step of their journey towards SRE? Well, there are a bunch of things you can do. Um, We've got two, sorry, two best-selling books. Uh, if you go to google.com forward slash SRE, you can read both of the books for free. We have a course on, in Coursera, uh, specifically on SLOs, uh, that's really very popular. If you're here at the show, come by the Fifth Nine and talk to SREs, talk to me or anyone else. If you're a Google Cloud customer, you can talk for free with the CRE team, the Customer Reliability Engineering Team. We are a group of long-tenured SREs, and. Our job is to teach you how to adopt SRE and make that easy and comfortable for you. Fantastic. All right, thanks, Dave. It is always a pleasure. Thank you, Rita. Thank you. Now, remember, if you're here at Next, come and join us at the Fifth Nine Lounge and talk to a bunch of SREs all about your SRE questions. And now we'll send it over to you, Stephanie. Thanks, Rito and Dave. Throughout the Next Live show, we're bringing you condensed versions of a few Next sessions that we're calling Dev Bites. Watch this next dev bite to learn how to surface problems and how to fix them using Stackdriver. As you move to the cloud and adopt the latest technology, such as Kubernetes, have you found it even harder to find the root cause of issues and understand just how well your application is performing? Stackdriver Application Performance Management, AKA APM, shines light on your cloud native and multi-cloud environments in order to help you solve these problems better. I'm Brian Zimmerman, Product Manager for Trace and Debugger. And I'm Morgan McLean, Product Manager for Stackdriver Profiler. Stackdriver is Google's suite of management and observability products. APM is focused on that deeper levels of debug style information to help reduce mean time to resolution, find performance optimizations, and build the best possible experience for your users. APM features three products, Stackdriver Trace, Stackdriver Profiler, and Stackdriver Debugger. Trace is our distributed tracing product. What is distributed tracing, you ask? Well, tracing allows you to visualize how a request flows through your environment. In microservices applications or highly distributed environments, understanding context and flow is essential to resolving problems. How do we use this in real life? For example, let's assume that we receive an alert that shows a jump in latency for our application. Trace gives us the best detailed data to help us up troubleshoot this error. With Stackdriver Trace, you can easily see the top requests, RPC calls, and associated latency, Find an example of the issue you're having with simple search and filter. And see a simple view of the request as it processes through your complex environment. This includes detailed custom information and annotations. 
For more detailed information, analysis reports are generated automatically. You can view an existing report or create your own to see how latency has changed over time. You can group these by percentile, and you can also drill down into example traces to find out exactly what happened to cause this issue. As you can see, Trace guides you from problem to service. Now we will show you how you can get from service to method with Stackdriver Profiler. Profiler can inspect the CPU and memory performance of all the functions in your code, and it shows you the calling relationships between them. Profiler can visualize your code on a flame graph, which shows calling relationships along the vertical axis and resource consumption on the horizontal axis. You can use a number of different filters, including weight filtering, which only shows data captured during periods of high consumption, and a focus filter, which shows all of the paths in and out of a selected function. If you need to visualize the performance of functions that are called throughout your code base, you can use the focus table which shows the aggregated cost of all the functions in the graph. Finally, once you've identified the area of code that you're interested in, it's time to inspect the behavior of this code to find the problem. This is where Debugger comes in. Stackdriver Debugger offers the ability to take log points and snapshots of your running code in production without impact, redeploying, or restarting your services. Traditionally, debugging involves analyzing logs and metrics, taking a guess at the problem, deploying some new code or a debug module, looking at the logs again to confirm, waiting for the issue, analyzing logs again, perhaps taking another crack at it. Stackdriver Debugger allows you to take breakpoints and snapshots in production without system impact, redeploying, or restarting your application. This allows you to tighten your troubleshooting flow significantly, as you're not having to wait for lengthy deployments. In addition to the efficiency gains, many customers report being able to bring debugging further up the troubleshooting stack to operators or SREs, further reducing MTTR and affecting customer impact. All of these APM tools work with code and apps that are running on any cloud or even on-premise infrastructure. So no matter where you run your application, you now have a consistent, accessible APM toolkit to monitor and manage the performance of your apps. With Stackdriver Trace, Profiler, and Debugger, APM enables developers and operators to track and resolve issues the way that Google Site Reliability Engineering does. You can start and stop your code without affecting your users and get insights into how your code is running on production, no matter what cloud you're using. Whether your application is just getting off the ground or if it's already live and in production, using APM to monitor and tune its performance can be a game changer. To get started with Stackdriver APM, simply link the appropriate libraries for each tool to your application and then start gathering telemetry for analysis. To learn more, visit cloud.google.com slash APM. And thank you very much. Later on the next live show, it's all about developers. We'll give you a tour of our featured demos in the dev zone. But first, more sessions on all six live stream channels, so check them out, stay tuned. Welcome back to the next live show. Thanks for joining us. I'm Stephanie Wong. And I'm Red Amaya. Stephanie and I have had a blast here at Next19 so far, and it's been great sharing the experience with you. If you missed anything across the last two days, head to g.co slash nextonair and watch all the content we're live streaming across the six channels. Build, run, analyze and learn, secure, collaborate, and the next live show. The developer keynote is just around the corner, so to warm up for the event, we've asked our colleagues Marissa Root and Dave Stankey to take us on a grand tour of the Developer Zone. Check this out. Hi there. Hey. I'm Marissa. And I'm Dave. And we work on the Google Developer Relations team. We're here at the DevZone, which is the ecosystem for developers here at Google Cloud Next. Right now at DevZone Theater, we're hosting a panel discussion with the authors of Go. This is an interactive session where people can learn about the language and find out what's coming next. Come with us as we explore the rest of the DevZone. Let's go. Banana. Excellent. Perfect. We got one. 
How's it look? Ah, I think it's looking pretty good, actually. Cool. I'm getting my snaps on here at the Network Journey Experiment, where we're showcasing the speed and breadth of Google's worldwide network. What's going on here, Carrie? Well, exactly. So we're demonstrating here how Google's investment in infrastructure allows our customers to move their data around the world without having to access the public internet. It, it's fast and it's secure. And what does taking selfies have to do with it? Taking selfies. So just like uh, when you travel and you get stamps in your passport, we're actually taking the data that makes up your picture, and as it passes through these different regions in these data centers, we stamp it with that location. So when it comes back around to the, the destination where we took these pictures, then we have actual proof that your data moved through all these data centers. Oh, that's really cool. Has my picture made it around the world yet? Ah, let's see. Indeed it has. All right. Looking good. None the worse for wear. Thanks. Thanks so much for talking with me today. Could you share a little bit what you and your team are up to here in the DevZone? So I'm from the Developer Relations Ecosystem team, and we are informing people here about the different community programs that we have in the area of cloud. Awesome, so what type of programs do you have that people can take advantage of? So we basically have three programs. Those are the Google Developer Experts, the ambassador in a specific area of technology. Awesome. We have the Google Developer Groups. Those are local meetups that you can go to all over the globe. And we also have the Women Tech Makers. That's a program that increases diversity. So specifically, there are programs that people can take advantage of in different communities all over the globe. Yes, you can basically, everywhere you go, you can go to meetup, you can meet Google Developer Experts and talk to them about your area of interest. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. It's 3.14 here in the dev zone, and that means it's pie time. We're celebrating because a fellow Googler of mine, Emma Hiraka Iwao, recently broke the Guinness World Record for number of digits of pie calculated using cloud computing for the first time to compute 31.4 trillion digits of pie. That's a lot of pie. I'm going to get my celebration on. That's mathalicious. Hi there, I'm here with Paris at one of the community corners. Hey Paris, how's it going? It's going good, how are you Marissa? I'm good, what do you do here? I am a Google Cloud open source strategist. I work on upstream Kubernetes. I'm a co-chair of the special interest group for contributor experience. And what makes Kubernetes unique, you think? Uh, the community, definitely. I think we have one of the largest contributing communities. Uh, and I think it's important to get customers to participate in that, and that's why I'm here today. Awesome, and what have you been doing uh, while you've been here at the Dev Zone? Oh, playing arcade games. <laughs> like, it's been wonderful, like watching awesome speakers and meeting awesome contributors. It's been great to have all of this in one spot. We showed you just a few of the cool interactive experiences here at Google Cloud Next. But you don't have to be here in person to check this out. You can visit all of these experiences and more at g.co slash showcase. In addition, we're right in front of hands-on labs. You don't need to be here to do that. You can do it right now with Quick Labs. Get certified, learn all about Google products, and get started today. And be sure to subscribe to the Google Cloud Platform YouTube channel. Thank you so much for joining us here at the Dev Zone. We really appreciate it. Have a great day. See ya. Thanks for the tour, Marissa and Dave. It's cool to see a space dedicated to developers. And joining us now are developer advocates Rachel Tatman and Sarah Robinson to set the stage for what's in store during the developer keynote. Welcome. Rachel, uh, please kick us off by describing Kaggle. Sure. Kaggle is the home of data science. Um, so you might know us for our supervised machine learning competitions. Um, and we still do that, but right now we have a lot more on the site. So we've got public data sets that anyone can use. Um, if you want to analyze your own data, you can upload it privately, you know, not share it out. Uh, and we also have a hosted Jupyter development environment. So um, that includes GPU acceleration offered at no charge. And we just upgraded from K80s to P100s. So if you're looking for a little bit of like zhuzh in your algorithm run speed, uh, it can be a nice, nice little added bonus. Great. And how are data scientists and analysts utilizing Kaggle to support their machine learning projects? 
Yeah, a lot of different ways. Um, so the thing I think that's probably most unique about Kaggle is we have a really big community, about 2.7 million registered users, and we have a super active forum. Um, so it can be really hard to find information about your specific questions, especially machine learning and AI, and things are moving so quickly. So having a community that you can go to and ask questions and learn together is a really fantastic resource. And Sarah, have you used Kaggle in your work and seen its benefits in the ML community? Yes, I use Kaggle almost every day. Um, I'm always looking for interesting data sets for machine learning demos and Kaggle is my go-to for that. You can find almost any type of data set you're looking for, images, text, structured data on Kaggle. So it's been a great tool for me. That's fantastic. And what, uh, what ML AI launches are you most excited about? And, and tell me a little bit about why. There's some auto ML launches that I'm super excited about, um, really making it easy for anyone to use machine learning without having to have machine learning expertise. So the first I'll talk about is auto ML tables. Um, which makes it really easy to build custom machine learning models on structured data. So think about anything you might be able to put in a spreadsheet, categorical data, numerical data, building models on that. Um, with AutoML tables, that's really easy. Upload your data to the UI, press a train button, and your model's ready to go. Um, another AutoML launch I'm super excited about is AutoML Vision object detection. Um, so AutoML Vision can already do classification, but now what you'll be able to do is identify regions in your image where um, a certain label exists. So it will re return bounding boxes. So I'm super excited about, about those AutoML launches. Very cool. And we're about to see a showcase highlighting our work with the NCAA using BigQuery ML. What can you tell us about BigQuery ML specifically? Um, BQML lets folks that have structured data stored in BigQuery, uh, BigQuery is our cloud data analytics warehouse, so it lets you create machine learning models on that data stored in BigQuery um, just with a single SQL query. So you don't have to move your data out of BigQuery to use it. Um, it's super simple to use, so you just write a query, your model's trained, and then you can write another query to generate a prediction. Um, I actually gave a session on BQML earlier today um, with one of our customers, AAA, that's using BQML to predict call volumes across their call centers. Great. And Rachel, have you also heard about BQML in the launch, too? Yeah, definitely. Uh, and I checked out the NCAA showcase. Uh, one thing that I found really exciting was um, student developers um, were working on developing new features uh, for analyzing basketball games. Um, so one of them was clutchness, like how many points you're going to score in the last five minutes. Um, and I thought that was super interesting because on Kaggle, we've hosted NCAA competitions where you predict the winning team. Um, and I think it was a couple years ago, one of the very high placers had just used linear regression, which is available in um, a big Q. Big Query ML, let me say all the words correctly, um, and also these custom features that they developed. So I'm seeing some, some interesting synergy there. This is a perfect time to check in with our colleague Joanna Smith, who earlier had a chance to stop by our NCAA Showcase demo. Industry Solutions neighborhood of our expo floor, looking at this great energy, all these people are really excited, and I'm standing with Alok, who's gonna show us the NCAA demo. You wanna take it away? Yeah, so this is our second year at Google Cloud being the official cloud provider of the NCAA. Um, our theme is know what your data knows. So we've been working with the actual NCAA data, basketball data, oh, to fun. make a lot of in insights and predictions. So let's look at one. We just had a, a national title game, Virginia and Texas Tech, and what we're looking at here is the number of possessions each team will have in regulation. So we predicted that the number will be 63 or fewer, and it was 59 in regulation. So it was right. Not bad. Um, but we've done a bunch more. So one of the other things we did was oh, nice. we looked at a Data Studio dashboard. So Data Studio, another tool made by Google, allows you to visualize your data. Yeah. We had developed a bunch of different metrics for all these teams in NCAA. You can see them on the bottom here, score control, clutchness, discipline, et cetera. But we wanted to surface that data in a way that people could use, filter, and sort. So this has all the 353 teams, but if we just want to look at the champion, we can go here and select champion only. Should have been tagged. Boom, Virginia, <laughs> and now we can see where they rank in all the different categories. No, I like it. Yeah. Is so, that a good score for clutchness? Uh, yeah, so the ranks are right there, so you can tell it's seventh out of 353 teams. That's pretty good. The third in score control. They, they were deserving champion. So you said this is Data Studio, which we know is for visualization, which yeah. is really cool. But uh, you mentioned other cloud tools. I think BigQuery played a big part in this. Can yeah. you show me how that works? Yeah. So the first thing we have to do is write, uh, make a pipeline to ingest the data. So this is a small screen here, but I'll, I'll show you. This is on our Google Cloud blog. We describe the entire pipeline of how we built this data. Um, and you can see there's a bunch of stuff. And then we get to BigQuery right in the middle. And I'm a data scientist. I want stuff in BigQuery because then I can go and do all my stuff, right? So BigQuery, let's do it. Um, and then what we do from there is we take the data, we do a lot of manipulations, and to build that metric like score control, 
we have to write a bunch of code. All right, Sorry so we got the cloud that. blog, and then you also posted on Medium, right? Yeah. Some more fun insights? Yeah, so on Medium, what we did was we wanted to talk more in depth about how we built this metric. So one, we wanted to describe in detail for the technical people, but also talk about the basketball context. So you have this thing, how the final score can lie, score control, right? And in here, we go through a couple example games where teams control the score differently. But then, again, we get back to BigQuery. I love it. So here is a long query. And again, it looks fairly complicated. And it kind of is. But it actually is, when you think about how you go about doing this calculation, BigQuery makes it pretty easy with these aggregation functions. And it runs really fast. And it may be long, but it's easy to read. And, and it runs really fast, gets us our results for all um, thousands of games in a matter of seconds. And then we can move forward and do other stuff. I love scale power. Yeah. Now, um, you had one more thing in this blog, right? At the bottom, I thought I was playing with your, what was that, an interactive yes. scatter plot? So if we keep going here, eventually ah. we get to a point where we see the scatter plot, which spots all 353 teams in their school colors and shows their school difference colors. between the score control and a different metric. I like it. So if anyone wants to kind of find it at home, they can search NCAA on our cloud blog, yep. or they can look, uh, we're cross-linked. This is the cloud G, publication. Yeah, g.co slash March Madness. Oh, nice. I know it's a little bit past March, but the tournament is, is, is no, still fresh in our minds, forever. so it, should, it should, be, uh, should be fun to look at. Well, thank you so much for talking to me. Yeah. Wow, amazing showcase. How is BigQuery ML changing the game for machine learning for developers and practitioners? Yeah, good question. Um, two things that come to mind for me. Uh, first of all, being able to work in SQL. So something we found in our Kaggle machine learning developer survey is that SQL is actually the third most commonly used language for machine learning. So, uh, and also people who are outside of the machine learning AI space who are just coming into it, many of them are already familiar with SQL. So being able to use tools that you already know how to use is a really big time saver. Uh, and also you don't have to download data locally. So if you've got sensitive data that you can't store locally or it's just like really big and you can't store it on disk, being able to uh, do your, your regression in uh, BigQuery instead of having to like download everything, your Python code, and then upload everything once you've changed your model uh, can be a big time saver. And to add to that, I think PQML is a great entry point for machine learning. Um, so you don't have to worry about any sort of feature engineering. So if you have categorical data, for example, if you're building a model yourself, you would have to one-hot encode that into arrays. Uh, BigQML can recognize that it's a categorical column and transform your data for you. Uh, that's, that's excellent. Democratization of data has been a big theme at Google. We really believe that if you want innovation, you have to democratize access to data. Can you talk a little about how BigQuery ML and AutoML are having an impact towards us being able to achieve that goal? Yeah, definitely. So both BQML and AutoML make it easy for anyone, regardless of your machine learning expertise, to build your own custom machine learning model. So you don't need um, a lot of machine learning expertise to get started. You just upload your data, choose the type of model you want, and both BQML and AutoML will handle the rest. And AutoML specifically, you don't need as much labeled data as well. Um, so I know the um, uh, natural language API, sorry, the natural language AutoML that just launched, you only need 100 label examples per category for, for each label in your, your categorical learning example, um, which is very little data, especially when you're looking at like Bird or Elma or these really, really enormous GPT-2, enormous language models. Um, so being able to get started with relatively little data, smaller time investment, smaller money investment for labeling is a really big you know, movement towards democratization. Great. And Sarah, you'll, you'll actually be talking about the path from cloud auto ML to custom model in your breakout session. Can you give us a preview of the key factors when moving from auto ML into custom ML models? Yeah, definitely. So the goal of our breakout session tomorrow, I'm going to be speaking with you, Fang, um, is to teach people that may not have built their own custom model before how to get started. Because um, at least for me, the process of starting to learn how to build a custom model was really intimidating. There's lots of resources out there. It's hard to know where to get started. Um, so we're going to break it down and talk about feature transformations, feature engineering that you need to do to go from auto ML to custom model um, and walk through some code and there'll also be a couple live demos. Now, uh, Rachel, you'll also be leading a session tomorrow uh, using Google's data and AI technologies with Kaggle. Uh, what sort of things will you cover and what part of it are you most excited about? Cool. Um, so we are going to give people a little, little tour of Kaggle because a lot of things have changed recently. Uh, and then we're also going to talk about several integrations that we've made recently. And honestly, the one that I'm most excited about uh, is the ability to take a Kaggle data set and launch it as a Sheets 
instance, a Google Sheets instance with a single click of a button. Um, and one place where I think this could actually be extremely useful for people is for project management. So you're writing a kernel in a notebook and you're, you're generating, let's say, your hyperparameter search space. You save that as a data set, you launch it as a sheet, and then you can you know, assign action items, link to other kernels, um, use chats, use color coding, which you wouldn't want to do in a CSV, but can be really super useful for project management. So I'm very excited about that integration. Very cool. Excellent. Thank you so much, Rachel and Sarah. Thanks for Thank having you. us. We'd love to hear from you watching online, so send us your questions and comments with the hashtag GoogleNext19. That's a wrap for today. Be sure to join us tomorrow starting at 9 a.m. Pacific time for our final day at Google Cloud Next 19. The day will start with morning sessions, then Stephanie and I will chat with Adam Seligman, Vice President of Developer Relations. Be sure to check out all the live stream content from the last two days all on demand at g.co slash nextonair. The keynote is about to start. Let's head over there now.